but so I thought, yeah, I want to bring that mm-hmm. to it. But I didn't have enough juice, so I went and bought some um, uh, Merlot juice. I bought a wine right. kit, a Merlot wine right. kit, and threw out everything and just took the juice. And um, it's called, I call it Shamerlo because it's half and half. But I macerated mm. it, or I, I let it sit on the skins for, God, I have to get my notes, but I want to say a couple of weeks. It was a, it was a goodly yeah. time. And, uh, and I just kept yeah. tasting it like every day until it got to where I wanted it, and then I racked it off those skins. But it, I think it added a ton mm-hmm. of mead, a ton. Well, sure. Yeah. So I want to suggest that we leave our lees in our mead for a month after the fermentation has stopped. But there's a caveat to that. Never, ever should you not keep your lees in suspension in your must all the time. In other words, every day, regardless of where in the process you're at, maybe every second day at the very most, you need to get in there and you need to stir everything off the bottom back up into the must. And the the longer past your fermentation finish, the quicker that stuff will start to to drop out. In other words, when your fermentation is is still active, a lot of that's going to stay up in suspension on its own. Um, But over time, as as more and more yeast start to die, they're going to start to fall to the bottom. If, in fact, you let all your leaves pile up and bury each other alive, along with all of your detritus, the the solids, and if you're making a, a fruit mill or something, all of all of the gunk, all of the organic bits and pieces, if you let all that pile up on the bottom, it will then have a, an opportunity to start making off flavors, and it'll get reductive. It'll start making sulfurish notes. But if you keep that stuff stirred up, up in your must, it's not going to do that. And what you'll find is over time, once the fermentation is over, uh, the dead yeast will act as little sponges and they'll start to absorb some of the stuff that's in your must that would need to age out over a period of time in the aging process. And then secondly, you start to have some some binding going on um, and your different molecular structures will start to bind together and so then you have little small chain strands that don't weigh enough to sink to the bottom but as they collide and collect with each other they'll start to to weigh more and eventually molecularly they will weigh enough that the weight of them pieces the strands now will sink to the bottom so So the longer past your firm hang on just a second Mm -hmm. the longer past your fermentation the faster and the more that that stuff will drop out each day, so you want to continue to stir it up until you then decide, now it's time for me to let it, by design, drop out to the bottom because I'm now ready to rack. And I have found, personally, that if I keep my lees suspended, and that's very important to understand, keep it in suspension, if I wait for a month after my fermentation is over, I think that, the aging process, even though I don't have a bunch of fuchsils and, fuchsils and stuff, I think that by doing that, I've shortened my aging process in half. Huh. Have you done a but, side-by-side but side very, with this, with letting the leaves settle versus keeping them stirred up? That's really fascinating. Um, I haven't done a side-by-side side of letting them settle because I'm opposed to that, because I think that when you bury them on top of each other, that's when, that's you when start, things go icky you, inside. Yeah, I know, but that was right. why it was always about when do you rack, you know. But, I mean, people have been letting their leaves sit forever and ever, at least in the mead world. And, you know, so keeping them stirred up kind of flies in the face of general conventional wisdom. Yeah. Well, actually, well, keeping, it, your, it, keeping it, it stirred before it's completely done not only helps degas it so oh, things yeah, settle yeah. out when it's really done, but also by causing all of the little particles in the must to keep coming in contact with each other, it sort of acts like um, an agglomerate. What you end up with is what he was saying, all, all of the little particles end up sticking together so that they sink out better. Yeah. So by keeping right. it cloudy, you actually make it clear faster. And yeah. this I know because we've proven that. I, I've proven that myself in lab classes. Okay, okay. Okay, so yes, this yes. is good, and this is good to but, know because a lot of people. I mean, all right, how many pictures? No, no, don't stir it up. No, that actually right. does help it clear. How many really, pictures have you seen of people with the with the inch and a half of 
scrum at the bottom of the settling leaves yep. and you know i mean and, and, yep. and I've do, i did that for a long time you know i mean i stirred right well, now i stir pretty much until the primary fermentation because it just keeps going so fast that you're done by the time the leaves have settled all the way out so you're racking off it anyway but there's a lot yeah. of people especially a lot of newer people that are they're going oh it's a month and it's still not settled and so it's been sitting there that whole time so i think we probably should spend maybe a little bit of time and it'll probably take us into pushing everything till next week. But talking about, <laughs> you know, when is the proper time to rack off the lease? Because that is a moving target. And people need mm-hmm. to know when that is so that they can understand that better. Because that's, that, I see right. that question right. a lot. Well, just today, or maybe it was yesterday, a, a fella had a couple pictures of some single gallon glass, um, you know, jars, jugs that he had some meat sitting in it and the meat on top of the leaves were crystal clear I mean as clear as you could have ever got with some fining agents was that the pineapple the bottom one? third of it uh, I don't know if it was pineapple well, it, looked, it may have been because it was kind of that color but the bottom that, third was was was, was, full was of crap. Yeah. yeah I saw I saw yeah. that one too it was beautiful I mean the top third was just as clear as a, it was gorgeous and and the bottom right. I'm going oh that's man right. I'm not looking forward to racking off that um you know yeah. and and but see that's the thing that's what for decades you were taught to mm-hmm. let it settle out and when it settled out then you rack and didn't really right. talk about this, and, you know, the, and, and I see what you're saying makes a lot of sense. It really does. Because when I think about it, if you're using a staggered nutrient process and you're following the stirring and aerating when it needs it and degassing when it needs it, then it never really gets a chance to settle because, you know, by the time you're done with all of that, the main ferment's done and you're racking anyway. And I'm here to tell you that if most of the time, so he, Here's here's some uh, here's some thoughts. If you're gonna leave your leaves in there, and I have a there's a professional meadery here in Colorado, they make outstanding stuff. They age their stuff on the leaves for a year before before they'll sell it, and, and they could yeah. sell their stuff a lot faster if they didn't want that the complexity and the mouth volume and all that that brings. But you have to be careful about that, and we'll talk about that probably next week. But so. I want to backtrack because I want people to be very clear what I'm saying here. You have to, and the word that you would want to look up if you want to Google it is called rouse. You want to rouse the leaves or rouse your yeast every day. That's very important to understand. You need to keep that up in suspension so it's not getting buried down on the bottom on top of each other. That's when they become reductive and they start turning into goo is because they're they're decomposing and they're being buried alive by by their buddies on top of them so you don't want that to happen and if you will keep them roused providing you had a clean fermentation meaning you didn't ever have any stinky batches or any sulfur issues or or anything that would be other than a great clean fermentation you can then leave the leave the stuff on the lease for around a month or so if in fact though you did have a stinky batch for some reason, and generally now, if you're practicing temperature control, like we all know is vitally important, and we're feeding our yeast, I don't think you should have stinky batches anymore. Um, but if you do have a stinky batch and you can't rescue that right away by agitating the crap out of the must, in other words, very aggressive degassing, you're trying to degas the sulfur out of there, and sometimes, generally people think, well, I need to feed my my yeast some more food I'm a kind of of the mind that most of that time that's probably not going to really work because by the time that they're getting stinky and if it's later on in the fermentation they're not they're not really taking up any more nitrogen anyway and so it, it's too late at that point in the game now if you wanted to look at that extra food that you just put in there if it's fermate oh those are dead yeast and so that will act as a sponge to some degree to start absorbing some of that stuff but i really feel like for the most part when we're trying to rescue a stinky batch by throwing more food in there we're too late in the process and so i like to believe that we want to eliminate that by taking care of them up front to begin with well and so 
it bears mentioning too that the rousing process that you know you're advocating here is also one of the most tried and true methods of unsticking a stuck ferment. Yes, then that, another one that is could very uh, well be because you're stirring up and you're you're letting all of the CO two that built up, which is toxic to the yeast. That's why we degas every day because that'll keep your your fermentation that'll keep your pH from crashing by letting it escape out of the top instead of instead of binding to your must inside and getting stuck in there. In other words, if you have a stinky batch and it smells like sulfur, if you don't do something with that and eliminate it pretty quickly, it will over time eventually actually stick molecularly to the stuff in your must and you're not going to be able to get it out. Yeah, it uh one of the, it, it depends on when, at what point in your fermentation you're getting the stink. If it's like in the first third of fermentation, then yeah, you probably do need mm -hmm. more food. And if it's after that, right. then um, yeah, you what I what I've done, yeah. yeah, what I've done is because I don't have fermate. Oh, I just take a bunch of uh, bread yeast and put some water in it and might nuke it in the microwave and put that in. And I find that sometimes vacuums things up. But it also right. depends on right. the kind of stink you get too. Because I have one particular batch that smells like vomit. And it's just what it does, mm, right. and it goes through this really disgusting barfy phase in the middle, and it doesn't seem to matter what I do, and it clears out just fine. So, you and know. I bet that's a, what, what yeast brand is that? Oh, it's a Lelve. I just can't remember which yeast. Uh, I think I've had yeah. it happen. It, it's the same fruit, though. It's happened several times when I've done oh, red currant. Yeah. Oh, and I think in this case really it's astringent. That might be part I of think it. it's, um, I think it's an acidity thing in this particular yeah. case. Right. And so, you, in that case, you have to watch the pH, and that, that's another thing. If your if your mead goes stinky, you have to figure out why. Uh -huh. Is it stressed and perform? You know, what what kind of stink is it? Because mm -hmm. you know, depending on the kind of stink, it can indicate whether it might be a pH issue or whether it might be a making sulfur because they're pissed off issue or they need food issue. Mm -hmm. Like RC two twelve, I find needs a lot of food. Otherwise, it gets all stinky sulfury on me, and it smells like a rhino fart. <laughs> hey, uh, Ryan, I, I, I automatically you. I okay. automatically schedule twice as much food to go to RC212 batches as any other thing I ever make. It's finicky. And I find that, yeah, I mean, it's worth it, but it's a real finicky pants while it's fermenting. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and the Lalvin charts will tell you that, too, that yeah. that's a high nutrition required yeast. Yeah, yes, but when they say it's a high requirement, they don't say how much extra you need to add. Or at least when I was no. researching it, they don't. So what yeah. I figured out for myself by trial and error is it's about double. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's what because I didn't realize that when I used RC two twelve and it and it just wasn't very happy yeast at all. And they're not kidding. Just as an aside on the Lalaman thing, if they say this is the temperature range, they are not screwing around. <laughs> don't go over. That. <laughs> don't go over that. Bad things happen. So yeah, um, Ryan, I hope you have on your list in this uh, series that you're doing here to uh, get to like two, maybe even three shows where we just talk about if it's doing this, you need to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we, yeah, we could certainly do that. Um, we are going to dedicate a complete show with Tom Reapus to talk about effective SO2 management because too many people uh, have a misconception that they have stabilized their stuff when in fact... There's so much more involved than just adding a, quart, a fourth of a teaspoon to six gallons that, mm -hmm. that that doesn't even come close to doing things right. Can we have him do you a know, second a show people... about how raisins aren't nutrients? <laughs> I well, had to. I had to. I'm sorry. Be in the same part. <laughs> be, before I forget, I want to remind everybody, we just talked about pH. I feel that if, you're, if you consider yourself a meat maker, you really need to buy a pH meter. Uh, because that's important to monitor too. They're not very expensive anymore. You can buy a cheap pH meter that works just fine. I've got a, a Venometric, which is like a six hundred dollar unit that measures a whole bunch of things, and so it's it's actually a, a lab grade analyzer. And one of the things that it does <laughs> measure is pH. Nerd, but Ryan. my four, <laughs> my 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 fourteen dollar. My fourteen dollar pH meter is absolutely every bit as accurate as my six hundred dollar analyzer. And you guys want you need to buy a pH meter. Don't use the strips; they're not effective. They're not accurate enough. 
but you want to know what you're. Nothing, but they're not accurate. They, they might be better than nothing, but they're not accurate enough. Um, 